Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. In Washington, the town was abuzz about an alleged Iranian plot to assassinate the Saudi ambassador to the United States. Uh, there's such skepticism about this story, I don't think I've ever seen anything like it, where the White House comes out with an official version that there was such a plot, except even the mainstream media has pundits all over television and in print saying nobody can believe this story. What's the story? Well, supposedly, the Iranian Revolutionary Guards had this guy in Texas who's an Iranian living in the United States who makes some deal, except it winds up he makes a deal with an agent of the DEA, and this is supposed to get in a Mexican gang to come assassinate the Saudi ambassador. Anyway, the whole thing sounds uh, a little bizarre, but the White House is, uh, keeps affirming that we have good information and are threatening the toughest sanctions possible in retaliation against Iran, and the Saudi government is uh, also joining the chorus. So what the heck do we make of all this? Now joining us to try to unpack this is Gareth Porter. He joins us from Washington. Gareth is an investigative journalist and historian. Thanks for joining us, Gareth. Thank you, Paul. All right, so I'll have to apologize to all our viewers for me sounding so skeptical about all this, but what can I do? So Gareth, well, first of all, what do we know about the facts? Well, as you say, uh, you know, the facts uh, in this case are so difficult, as they've been presented publicly by the administration, uh, are so difficult to believe that it has uh, provoked uh, an unprecedented skepticism toward the, uh, the official uh, version of, of this uh, so-called Iranian terror plot. And the reason for the skepticism is that uh, everybody knows that the Iranian government and indeed the IRGC and the Quds Force uh, in the past have dealt with issues of using uh, explosives uh, where they have done so very, very carefully uh, and with a very fine hand. Uh, and, and this uh, sort of plot does not uh, fit with the behavior of the Iranians at all. So if you really look then at the uh, record or, or the uh, the investigation report by the FBI uh, to a court in the southern uh, in southern New York, uh, which document I have uh, now carefully uh, looked at and analyzed. What you find is that there is very strong uh, evidence in this uh, document to suggest that what really went on was an FBI sting, which is to say, once this Iranian American. Mansour uh, Arbabsiar met with uh, a, a Mexican who he believed to be part of a, a leading uh, Mexican drug cartel, but who was in fact a DEA informant, underground informant. Uh, he, uh, the, the FBI stepped in and began to guide the DEA informant. And what happened then uh, over the period of uh, late June to mid-July is the big mystery surrounding this case. Because we know from this document, that is the FBI report on its investigation with the evidence that they claim to have gathered, that there were a number of meetings, they don't even tell us how many meetings, between our Bob C.R. and the DEA informant uh, during uh, a little bit more than two weeks. And that w we find that there's absolutely no specific record in terms of quotes from any of those meetings suggesting that our Bob C.R. acting on behalf of some group of Iranians back in Tehran was suggesting that he wanted this uh, drug cartel in Mexico uh, to kill the uh, uh, Saudi Arabian ambassador in Washington. Uh, and in fact, uh, what we can uh, discern from the absence of any quotes of any kind uh, from the Saudi, uh, excuse me, from the Iranian American uh, character, or Bob Siar, during this two week uh, period, is that what was really going on was something quite different from what the administration and the Justice Department are now claiming. And there is uh, a good uh, deal of uh, circumstantial evidence, again, but also direct evidence in the form of a statement attributed to a law enforcement official by uh, Bloomberg 
uh, reporters that Arbabsyar actually told the DEA informant that he represented a group of Iranians who had uh, a lot of opium and that they could give the or, or sell to the uh, uh, the supposed drug cartel in Mexico a tons of opium. So that suggests very clearly that what was really happening here was that the Iranian American was really contacting him in order to try to to do a drug deal, uh, and that then what happened during those two weeks or so was that the DEA informant, acting on behalf of the FBI, was leading him into a plot uh, having to do with the Saudi ambassador. We, uh, we don't know exactly how it went down, but the circumstantial evidence seems to point in that direction. Okay, uh, let me just emphasize that's, that's a hypothesis based on what you've been able to glean from whatever evidence we know. I mean, we obviously don't have access in, uh, in theory to everything that the White House does, but what you're offering is a plausible theory. Uh, I mean, one of the things I don't get about all this, uh, first of all, for anyone that might not have followed this story, although I, I guess most people have, but if you haven't, uh, somebody that knows this character in Texas has said, this isn't James Bond, this is Mr. Bean. Uh, <laughs> this is a guy who's, you know, who, who they say can't put match his socks properly in the morning. This is not someone you would pick to pull off a sophisticated plot. And the Iranian intelligence agencies and the Revolutionary Guard, if they're nothing else, they're quite sophisticated about this kind of stuff. Well, it's not only that, Paul. It's also the fact that uh, Mansour uh, Arbabsiar was also known as somebody who was primarily interested in making money. And uh, significantly, at a time when he had uh, already... Uh, arranged for a wire transfer of $100,000 from Iran to a bank account that turned out, of course, to be uh, an FBI covert uh, bank account. Uh, he was in Iran and ran into an, a friend from Corpus Christi, Texas, his hometown, and told this guy that he was about to make uh, a good deal of money, which suggests, again, that what was going on here was that uh, he was involved in talking to this uh, DEA undercover agent about a drug deal as well as uh, what was being suggested in terms of uh, something having to do with the, uh, the uh, Saudi Arabian embassy and the ambassador. Yeah, now let, let me just say to our viewers that you know, my skepticism, and I, I would guess Gareth shares this, but I'll ask you, is not that there couldn't be somebody on the other end in Iran who might be in or being sucked into this idea of assassinating the Saudi ambassador. I and mean, it's not in question, uh, uh, to my mind at least, not out of the question. There are, uh, as I understand it, forces within Iran that look for provocations with the United States. What's so skeptical about this is that this would have anything to do with the leadership because th they don't have any history of anything so dumb as this. Well, that's exactly right. I think that all the indications are that what we're talking about here is a group of Iranians who were primarily involved in uh, basically getting uh, a large amount of, of uh, opium, which of course comes in from Afghanistan into Iran, and Iran apparently controls the vast majority of all of the uh, opium that is uh, taken uh, captive uh, by authorities in the entire world. Uh, and of course, they're looking for opportunities to make some money off that. And so I think that we're de dealing with a group, of, a private group of Iranians, which also may have had some political uh, ambition or political aim in embarrassing or uh, causing difficulty for the present Iranian government with the United States or just in general. Yeah, I mean, one never understands, uh, at least we don't, the, all the infighting that's going on in the Iranian elite. But there are certainly, this is be nothing new for one of the factions to want to create some kind of provocative moment with the United States in order to advance their internal struggle. But all that being said, the question I'm left with is, how the heck can the uh, uh, White House, how can President Obama, one, take this so seriously, if, if he really does, it seems he does, and how the heck do you go public with this when, when everything is so dubious? Well, I think the, the answer to that question is quite simple and straightforward, which is that the White House uh, is going to seize on any opportunity uh, to uh, not only embarrass, but to isolate Iran politically 
uh, on the international stage, uh, primarily because of domestic political pressures on the White House to take an even more uh, uh, extreme position with regard to its policy toward Iran. The, the pressure, of course, coming from pro-Israeli interests, from the Israeli government itself, and from its lobby in Washington and the United States. And so uh, it's almost pathetic uh, the way the uh, administration has latched on to this story and made it the centerpiece of its policy toward Iran now. Uh, I mean, part, part of I mean, uh, when I start to think about this story, I actually wonder if there aren't people whose actual objective is to embarrass President Obama because... You know, this is starting to become a joke, and with him taking it so seriously, by implication, it makes him look naive or way too eager to please people who want to have a go at tougher sanctions or more against Iran. Well, I don't know if you're if you're suggesting that uh, people within the U.S. government who mounted this scheme were were having that motive, but I think it gets more difficult as you move from the Iranian side to the American side to suggest a kind of conspiratorial uh, uh, angle that is against the administration. I, I have to believe that the administration was fully informed at every stage of this and was going along with the entire sting operation, which is, is exactly what we have to call it. And by the way, I think that you know, we have to be aware of the parallel, the very strong parallel between what appears to have happened in this case uh, with the DEA informants' uh, conversations unknown, completely unrecorded or recorded and uh, not uh, at all quoted from in these uh, two weeks of meetings, uh, and the domestic terror cases where the FBI clearly uh, set up uh, a number of uh, people in this country, uh, Isl Islamic people in this country, for uh, terrorism charges by uh, in many cases, offering large amounts of cash for people to come into a plot uh, involving terrorism. Uh, and one, one can't also rule out what possible role the Saudis might have in all this. We know from WikiLeaks and, of course, from even more public sources, that the Saudis are also kind of urging the U.S. to increase their confrontation with Iran for their own regional interest and for other reasons. Yes, of course, the, the Saudis have a great interest in this, and of, of course they have now, uh, a, a Saudi official unnamed, has uh, claimed uh, to a reporter that, yes, we recognize uh, the name of this guy uh, who is, who is uh, named as one of the people involved in the plot in Tehran because he was uh, involved in the case of Bahrain. He was, he was the Iranian who was in touch with Bahraini and Shia and causing them to, to take extremist acts. Of course, I don't take that very seriously. That is an obvious effort to take advantage of this storyline uh, to advance uh, Saudi interests in the, in the case of, of Bahrain. Anyway, uh, uh, an increasingly bizarre story. Thanks very much for joining us, Gareth. Thank you, Paul. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.